Hey you guys, welcome to the Dr. G Show. Uh, this is, I think, episode 215. Is that right? 13. 13, that doesn't sound right. Alright, <laughs> let's do episode 213. And um, we've been explaining kind of functional medicine, the concepts, and kind of the, the practice of it for the last couple episodes. And as our special guest, we have Suzanne. So Hi, everybody. S- Suzanne Blockett, um, and we're going to talk about, uh, <laughs> I asked her if she had any, like, insights in what we're talking about tonight, and she's just like, no. no. So, <laughs> I told him I was just going to agree. Agree, yeah. yeah. No, I'll come up with something. Don't worry. Don't you worry. All right, so we're going to talk about functional laboratory interpretation. <clears throat> Years ago, I got roped into teaching this um, all across the country to other doctors, And, you know, I thought I was going to be like just chewed up and spit out by all these seasoned doctors, you know. I would think I was five years out of school and I had a little bit of functional medicine kind of training by then. And turns out uh, nobody knows anything. So (laughs) it's a giant mess. And to compound that, like um, research came out years ago from the New England Journal of Medicine from... Uh, the Washington School of Medicine and they published a study that said that 52% of all diagnosis and treatment in the United States is incorrect which is insane because that means like a lot of diagnoses a lot of treatments that are based off those misdiagnoses are making people broke and causing uh, nutrient depletions and side effects and was it real Right? Well, I've heard a lot of people. I'll jump in here. <laughs> oh, now she has something to say. I have had, <clears throat> I've heard so many people talk about the fact mm. that they've had their labs misread. That's a huge thing. And then some people actually, uh, I think recently, um, somebody on my social media page said that their labs were misread and their, they died. Oh, man. Well, like, that was real. That is not a that is not a small thing. Not my patient. <laughs> no, but but my point is is that you know there's a lot of misdiagnosis out there. Yeah, yeah. and in the the study, you know, it was like, you know, they were like, well, how is that even possible? But the way that doctors are trained, you know, they say there's not for primary care. They're trained for emergency, so it's always top three. So when even when I did rounds, you know, it was just like, what's your top three, top three, top three? Well, what about four, five, six, seven, eight? No, nope, ain't got time for all that. Next patient. Mm-hmm. Yep. So it's often you get that feeling that is how quick can you make the diagnosis and move on to the next patient, which then of course uh, causes all this. Like one in ten, even like one in ten uh, surgeries is in uh, uh, ends up with a complication or a. Um, Oh shoot, uh, an error. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> same with diagno- or same with prescriptions. One in ten. They actually did this uh, thing where they calibrated everybody, had like uh, barcodes and all this kind of stuff to help uh, prevent these errors. Ten years later, they redid the study. Still, one in ten was an error. <laughs> so that's not helpful. One so, in ten. One in ten. One in ten. Yeah. Wow, that's a lot. So you know, my older sister. I remember as a kid, they were willing her back to uh, do a surgery, and they kept calling her the wrong name. <laughs> and so they almost did some botched surgery on her. Um, let alone, I had a patient that they, uh, the ENT poked through their brain, through the nose, and they leaked cerebral spinal fluid for almost, I think, a year before they figured it out. So, talk about did, botching. Gosh, did she not have any symptoms at all? Just lots of fluid lots all the time coming out. Time. Yeah. So, uh, I used to teach this course mm-hmm. called Clinical Chem- uh, Applied Nutrition and Clinical Chemistry. Basically, how to do functional laboratory interpretation. And I was super amazed by how little uh, practitioners knew. And a lot of it comes down to, is it just used for diagnosis? And treatment so with um, with laboratory what's the goal of it right is the goal to figure out the quality of the patient situation or is it just to make a diagnosis or not make a diagnosis treat or not treat 
And that's where we get a big problem for, from, especially when you look at things like uh, thyroid is probably the biggest one we see this in, where the range is huge, right? And, and so just so you all know, uh, if you've had labs at two or three different places, you realize they don't use the same ranges. Like I created the lab, uh, laboratory database of the largest database of age and gender uh, specific lab values for the software that we created. And I was crazy surprised that there is not a standard lab range. So you can go to three different places, get the exact same test and have three different outcomes depending on how close it is to the, the range. So all they do is they say, well, in the sickest, fattest, dumbest population with most anxiety and depression where three out of four people are chronically uh, treating chronic conditions, what's the ranges we see people in? And then that becomes the new adjustment for that range. It's not a healthy range. It's not even optimal range. It is just the reference range of what we tend to see. So would you, would, would you say that uh, based on an individual person, the ranges might be different? Oh or yeah. So yeah. when I created that database, yeah. li the the there's a gender genderification of uh, a, a of lab values. Male and females don't have the same values, and then by age, there's lots of disparity within um, those lab ranges. But a lot of labs just go zero to a hundred mm -hmm. years old, and uh, male female doesn't matter. It's all the same. So our software actually uh, would take those. Uh, lab values in there and then actually extrapolate those based on uh, their age and gender but yeah like e even e EGFR which is a kidney one we'll talk about in a minute um, it's supposed to be by even race and gender but not everybody does that but they only do it because we tend to see changes in the race like so basically it's just black people and everybody else right and so the black people they uh, they'll give them a different lab value because they see more kidney diseases in that race in America. So then they just give them a different adjustment. So it's not that, you know, uh, black people versus white people versus Asian versus anybody else have actual different ranges, whether yeah. they're male or female. But it's just those reference ranges are adjusted because of that. And the whole goal is really just diagnosing. So... If you look at something like thyroid, thyroid range is like this big, right? It's huge. It's, it used to be 0.4 to like 6.5 or something mm -hmm. like that. And the goal is somewhere like 1 to 2, closest to 2. That's like your functional range. That's your most optimal range. Um, and all in all, it needs to match your clinical symptoms too. But they have this huge range, right? And so then they'll be like, well... You're all the way over here, almost out of range. And you're like, oh my God, I feel horrible. I'm so tired. I'm gaining weight. You know, like my brain's just not working. All the thyroid symptoms you would have for hypothyroid, but they're like, eh, you're still within that huge range. So you're fine. But the patient's not fine. Right. So if the goal is only to meet a diagnosis of hypothyroid, you failed, right? I mean... Or I say, you know, that you may have won that, sorry. Uh, it didn't meet the diagnosis. But does the patient symptomatology actually match that, that lab range? And is the lab range too high? Is that the real problem? And it's, yeah. I mean, like, you guys probably don't know. You can't do anything unless you have a payable code. So within my practice, functional medicine, we just do whatever the hell we want to do to get you better because we want the outcomes. But a typical standard practice that uses insurance, you don't get the same treatment. You have to meet a code, which is a diagnosis, to even get paid. So we don't typically care if you're really close. It's kind of, I always give the example, like say you go to the tire store and the, your tire is bald on the end, right? And just threads are showing, like this thing's about to blow out. Well, it's still within range. You're fine. I can't get paid to help you until you blow out. Now, once your car tire blows out, you swerve off the road, crash, flip over seven times, I can take care of you. We can get that tire fixed. Yeah, that's common. But that's, that's it's, it's common. really how we fail 
within laboratory diagnosis. Like it's that, that messed up. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it's just crazy. The other thing is, so within that 52% of mixed diagnosis, right? We're just, we don't look at the whole picture. It's just, can you diagnose this patient or not? Then move on. Now, natural medicine doctors get into this rhythm too, because mm -hmm. again, it's the, uh, are we gonna give you a supplement or not give you a supplement? Instead of a med, are we gonna diagnose, not diagnose, right? And so they end up falling into that too. And really, if that's your goal, then it becomes, you, people just gonna fall through the cracks with that. So um, I see one of the, I think the most common place I see that within natural medicine is anemia. Uh, over and over, mm -hmm. I used to be a part of those forums and uh, where all the doctors would present their cases, but they didn't want to hear what I had to say. <laughs> so I was just like, <laughs> they were like, patient has anemia, what do we treat them with? And all these doctors would be like, iron, this iron, you got to do the ferrous this, you got to do the biglycinate, you got to do, and I'm sitting here going like, what type of anemia? Is it diagnosed anemia? Is it iron deficiency? Or is it megablastic anemia? Is it normal cytic anemia? You got to look at the labs and figure out what, what it really is. And so a lot of my patients that come in from uh, even natural docs, they'll be diagnosed with iron deficiency anemia, but the size of the red blood cell isn't less than 80. It isn't even close. A lot of times they're in the hundreds, which is a totally different anemia which is treated totally different. So they end up getting these iron supplements for a diagnosis of anemia, but no one ever decided to look at the MCV value and say what size of the red cells are they and does it actually meet the diagnosis for iron deficiency anemia, let alone do an iron study and see what the hell's going on, right? So this is so, so common and I love when patients bring their labs in. Like I literally will go through and it's always upside down and backwards here, but I'll, um, <laughs> like, here's your blood sugar or stress. You know, here's your kidney test. Here's your liver test. Here's your electrolytes. Here's your protein metabolism. Here's your immune cells. Here's what each immune cell does. And then really helping them understand what all that means. Right? Uh, I was going to say, how many people, if you could write in the comments, how many people have actually got taken home labs? Or you, now it's all kind of digital you can find all your lab work um, and really you're just getting like, is it in range or no? You know, that it just yeah. gives you a little graph or whatever for each thing. And you're not really even for, for sure what all those each things are. But how many of you have actually taken home or read your, your labs and really can't understand it? Yeah. Um, just put in the comments. Um, because I honestly, I mean, I, I've worked in healthcare for a long time. Um, and I'll, I'll look at mine and I'll be like, I, I don't know. I don't yeah. know what that one is. And and is that good or bad? Or is that really good or bad based on who I am as a person? On my diet, my health, lifestyle, everything. Well, there is a little bit of that conspiracy notation that doctors speak a different language. Yeah, right. And so we don't, not we, they, often don't want you to know. So that's why we call stuff like megablastic cell or um, instead of or a macrophage instead of big eater cell. Like I know, you were throwing out the, that lingo and I, I've taken medical terminology, but I didn't know what you were saying. Yeah. So I'm glad you can explain it. So we make it a little bit more complicated, <laughs> kind of like lawyers are, right? So that way you can't just do what they do because you have to understand all the lingo. Yeah. So if patients don't have that control over their labs and their own interpretations, then often that puts them at the disadvantage and they don't know what's right and wrong with this, you know? Yeah. So um, if you guys have felt that way, let me know, you know? The other big <clears throat> thing I would say within uh, laboratory interpretation or functional laboratory interpretation is the kind of like zebras mm -hmm. versus horses. So within my field, like functional medicine, clinical nutrition, um, we love this idea of these zebras, right? I mean, if you in hear ho like hoof, hooves, right? Hear hooves? Hooves. 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 Like, hooves. Brum, brum. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> in America, you would assume horses. 
<laughs> but horses are boring. Show me zebras. I want it to be zebras. So you end up, and I can almost tell you, depending on what practitioner they come from, what diagnosis every single one comes in with. It is always the same diagnoses, but it's different from different practitioners because it's whatever their hyper focus is about, right? But it is rarely zebras. And I tell you, I had this patient one time. This guy was like maybe 65. Yeah. He was dating a naturopath. He had done $15,000 worth of labs, right? 15,000. And I'm sure he got a discount on those because of her. <laughs> or else she's scandalous all up charging her boyfriend. <laughs> but he's never felt better. So it's one thing to say, well, I do these kind of exotic tests and then I get, you know, patients better. But he wasn't getting better. And so I looked through all his files. He had a huge stack of all these labs, the most zebra kind of labs you can get, all the just, you know, most specialized labs, most expensive things you can do. No one ever did a CBC, a basic $10 test to say what's going on with your body. So a CBC, CMP, your, your ba most basic, basic, basic lab. And so we did one on him because that was the only thing really missing from his file. And turns out he was uh, critically in uh, kidney failure. Oh, And gosh. so his numbers were off the chart. And I said, look, you need to go to the hospital right now. Like, as soon as you leave here, go to the hospital. And he's like, well, you know, he said, I have an appointment with my doctor on Thursday. No, go to the hospital right now. And uh, so he was just like, because, you know, it's, it just didn't he seem might, like an emergency. Right, but, to him it didn't seem like yeah. it. He probably wasn't feeling anything weird. Yeah. Or maybe he was and just overlooking it like right, most of so, us do. Like, oh, there's a pain. Yeah, because eh. kidneys, it, it, it's a very vague symptom sometimes. Yeah. So he finally goes. It, and actually, uh, I think he had me contact his son and let him know what's going on. So he goes to the hospital, immediately gets admitted to the hospital. And uh, they said he was in the last stage critical gosh. renal failure. And his son messaged me like, uh, I don't know, a week or two later and said, he would have died. They said he would have died if he would have went another week. Oh my week. gosh. But that's where it's very frustrating yeah. from my standpoint when I teach this stuff yeah. is like, it's rarely zebras. <laughs> it's almost always horses. Do the very, very basics and get really good at basics. And, you know, even though I taught like organic acids and all these other tests, they're all kind of vague kind of tests. And... I haven't really needed them. <laughs> so I'm always like, look, we'll do hormone testing <laughs> if things don't work. Yeah. We'll do comprehensive testing if things don't work. But if you can do the very basics, save them a bunch of money and get the results and the outcome you want, great. Yeah. If something's not working, then start looking for the next level or the next phase or eventually the zebras. But rarely is it expensive, unique, yeah. comprehensive labs. Well, there's a couple questions, or there's at least one question. Joanne asks, and I've got a lot, lot of theories on this. Hmm. We, don't, we could talk another show on this, actually. But why don't doctors want us to know? Oh, because you don't want a bunch of questions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, and it goes back to insurance, too. I mean, it yeah. kind of starts there. Like, they don't have time. They just don't have time to go into a lot of detail, and maybe they expect at some point they'll someone will have to go into detail with you if you if you're not getting something cleared up. So. Yeah, and it's not in there. There's twenty thousand other th reasons why. Yeah, I mean, there's just I mean, because you know I, I have lots of doctor friends too. Like. I'm not saying anything bad. It's just that's not how you're trained. Yeah. You're just not trained that way. Yeah. Um, that's where even sometimes uh, patients are like. Oh, I want a medical doctor, not a nurse practitioner. Man, those nurse practitioner textbooks are totally different. I don't know if you guys know that, but I have a, a oh, I don't know, one of the, a big old giant textbook of like how to make diagnoses and treat uh, for nurse practitioners. I have one for medical doctors, mm -hmm. and in the medical doctor one, it's just basically what do I need for the diagnosis and what am I going to treat with? Yeah. 
in the nurse practitioner one, it was like, tell me about their families, what's their social dynamics going on. Like, it was really like the old school medicine of really, tell me about your situation and let's really kind of like decomplicate all this. But it's problem solving. But I didn't see that in the other textbook. I was very surprised that there was such a, a huge uh, difference between the two. But rarely in any of my textbooks is it like, let's figure out what's really going on. Yeah. <laughs> it's just not. <laughs> so it's, it's how fast, can, you know, the average, you guys know, the average amount of time a doctor will uh, interrupt you is 18 seconds. Mm -hmm. uh, within two minutes, they have a tentative diagnosis. Within five minutes, you usually have a prescription, you're out the door, right? And so research shows or stats show that 97% of a accurate diagnosis is through a good history and physical. And you can't do that in five minutes. No. And so the whole, you it's, don't have time to explain anything in that time. You just don't. My, I mean, you think about it, you've lived how many years of your life doing those things that you do? You know, all of our neuron pathways are all fixated. <laughs> our brain's in charge. Yeah. Um, at some point, I mean, it, ta it does take time to go through those phases and figure out really what, what your body's being told to do and what, how it's responding and yeah, responding to eating and food and alcohol and all kinds of different things. So it does I mean, take time. How, how many weeks do you think in general? What? Like on a general basis, when someone comes to see you, it's a, it's a process of how many weeks? So... Or, Probably about 95% of people are better within six to eight weeks. It doesn't feel, take a whole feel lot. Feel better. Yeah. Feel better. But like, it takes an hour. I mean, I like I visit with people an hour uh, every visit. And so like, I, I when I was back when I was married, my ex was mad. I was just like, you got to cut those visits down. You can't spend so much time with people. And I was like, so I tried to do half an hour. I can't explain anything <laughs> comprehensive enough for half an hour you know i want them to understand exactly why they have what they have yeah. the, the 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 physiology behind it the mechanism behind it and how we're going to fix it and it just takes time it takes time so you know the old old school doctors which two generations ago were all natural medicine doctors but mm -hmm. even a couple of generations you know it's they used to spend time i mean anymore it's not it's not a cut finger yeah. It's complex, the yeah. things that we're doing these days. Yeah, my neighbor who's a nurse practitioner, she said, because I asked her, like, my patients average about 30 to 60 things chronically falling apart. And I was like, how do you do that in five minutes? How are you <laughs> seeing these patients that I see, and you're only spending five minutes? And she goes, one thing. You get one thing, and that's it. If you have other things, you're going to make another appointment. Yep. But, like, that's right. how are you ever going to get better? How are you ever going to solve this person's complex health crisis, right? So, uh, that's why we have so many uh, misdiagnoses in the United States. Yeah. And so many errors within pharmaceuticals delivery and uh, surgery still, too, which is crazy. Well, and then people rely on that sometimes, too, because they do initially get some relief. And I know that our system, like, will adjust to that, and then we're going to need more of that to combat that. So. thought you weren't going to say anything during this episode. Uh, I know. <laughs> yeah. Where, where's my music? <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, I mean, that diagnosis goal versus quality of care <laughs> is a totally different, totally different directions for you. Yeah. Like, do you really want to have, understand what's going on with their thyroid? Or do you want to just put them on a medication or supplement? Mm -hmm. Right? So, if your goal is reversing that's a whole different world. So that's where like even like thyroid testing, the only number that actually matters is T3 free. That's the only bioactive one. It's 90% of all the thyroid produced. Um, and it's the test that nobody does, you know, like free or uh, reverse T3 is a backflow. T3 is like 99.64% of that's not used. It's already bound to thyroglobulin. So that number means nothing. T4, which is the medication, only 10% of the free T4 actually is beneficial. But then if you say, well, what affects it? Well, 90... What? <laughs> I'm trying to keep up. Oh, I know. I see, get all... <laughs> the T3 and the T4. So all that is is you have a tyrosine amino acid. 
Okay. If it has three iodines, it's called T3. T3, a cell. If you have four... A cell, right? No, no, no. No. A, a, a amino acid. Oh, an a amino acid. So gotcha. you have amino acid, okay. and if it has three iodines on there, it's T3. If there's four, it's called T4. Four. So 90% of all thyroid in your body has only three iodines on it. What has four? No, the fourth, to make the fourth one active, it loses one. 90% of that T4 will lose an iodine to become T3. Oh. Yeah. So if somebody has four, mm -hmm. what does that mimic? Like a, a, a fatigue? No, no, no. So, okay. All right, so your brain makes a hormone called TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. And that brain hormone goes to your thyroid and then tells your thyroid to make hormone. So if the thyroid stimulating hormone is overstimulating or a really high number, it's yelling at your thyroid because it's not making enough. Hmm. If the brain is whispering to the thyroid, like, dude, you're making way too much, you need to chill the hell out, <laughs> then that number will be very low. So we kind of like inversely proportion. If, if this number's high, this number's probably low. If this one's low, this one's probably high, right? But that's not really true because why not test the actual thyroid and see what it's doing? Yeah. So the thyroid's simple. That gland, it makes uh, three basic hormones. Reverse T3, which is a backflow that does nothing. T4, which is the medication route. Uh, so Synthroid is T4. So the only reason we really give a shit about T4 is because they want to see, are you getting enough medication? But is that medication converting into the active form? We don't know. So why the hell are we wasting our time testing something we don't know? So with Good that point. T4, 10% of that T4 becomes free T4 and runs the body. But that's only 10%. 90% mm -hmm. of that T4 loses the iodine and becomes T3. So then they might test T3, but T3, 99.64% of T3 is bound to this thyroglobulin, this protein, and it's useless. 99.64% of all the thyroid that made is useless, does nothing. But 0.4% of that T3 is the bioactive one that runs every single cell in your entire body. So when you talk about thyroid hormone, you're really talking about the bioactive one, T3 free, which is 0.4% of the whole entire production. Runs everything. Sexual maturation, hormones, mood, growth, everything. Sleep. Sleep, basal metabolic rate. So when you look at that, the range is 2.2 to 4.2. And we like to see it three and above. And three and above, people are functioning really well. But they could have a normal T3 free and uh, not function very well, right? So in the end, the question is, why are they not producing enough to feel good? But the thing that blocks T4 from converting to T3 is chronic stress. So in the end, thyroid problems aren't thyroid problems. Thyroid problems are cortisol problems. Cortisol problems are uh, you live in the country with the most anxiety and depression, uh, and we're the best at like exhausting that. So we have to teach people to stop exhausting that, which is the resiliency and our plasticity and education, all that stuff. So if someone gets a thyroid test, a TSH is just, are we going to diagnose and treat with a medication? Or are we actually going to figure out what the hell's going on with the thyroid. So that's where even natural medicine doctors get hung up with that and they do all these different ones. I mean, you might want to do like a thyroglobin antibodies or a thyroproxidase <clears throat> antibodies because those are the two most common for autoimmune thyroid, mm -hmm. like a Hashimoto's or a, a Graves. Okay, yeah. But most people just have low performing thyroid because they have exhausting lifestyles. So then you go see someone like, Andy Jameson, get the head straight. And <laughs> stop exhausting themselves. Hey, Andy, if you're watching. So. Oh, hi. He's watching. Oh. Hi, Andy. You saw that. I didn't. Mm. It's too far away. So, 
like just thyroid by itself, there's, uh, I mean, that's one of the biggest areas I think we ever see uh, errors all day, every day. Mm -hmm. Another one, we talked about anemia. So just, you know, you might find this interesting. If you want to know if you have anemia, <laughs> you do a CBC, complete blood count. But on the CBC, your red blood cells are usually like three to five and you want them to be around four. So that's your bone, the red marrow, the juicy stuff. Uh, that's making your red blood cells. And they start out really big called megakaryocytes and then they mature down to the right size. So uh, when we look at like red blood cells, that is not anemia. But you will have them diagnose anemia because they're not making as many red blood cells. That's a misdiagnosis. Anemia is based off of hemoglobin. And then hemoglobin is how well is oxygen on capacity on your uh, red blood cells. So we have these red blood cells and we have iron and the iron pulls oxygen to it. So it's just like a donut with a, a donut hole attached oh, to it. Yeah. yeah. So when red blood cells are too big, they're a hundred on, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. So with hemoglobin, for women, it needs to be greater than 12.5. For men, it needs to be greater than 13.5. But that's really because men tend to be bigger than women. But if you have a tall woman, that's not the right range. If you have a little dude, that ain't the right range. So again, we treat patients, not labs. But on average, about 12.5 for women, 13.5 for men. If they're not above that, or they're below that, then that's anemia. So then the question is why you have anemia, right? So, and again, uh, on our kind of optimal range is 14 to 16 <clears throat> is kind of where you want to see hemoglobin. But hemoglobin is based on use. So if you're just chilling and laying around, you probably won't have very high hemoglobin. But if you look at someone who like is very active, 14 to 16 is an easy goal for that. Mm -hmm. So you produce lots of red blood cells and you produce lots of iron and then you have lots of capacity for the oxygen and you feel awesome. So it's so simple. Do they see that? Do you see? Why is it on my phone, not on you? Oh, it's not catching up yet. <laughs> it's I don't on see. Your I don't phone. see. I don't see your it on there. Your phone is live. This is behind a few oh, seconds. There's a thumbs emoji. up emoji on the screen. I'm like, I don't know if people see that or just me. <laughs> Maybe I'm crazy now. So it's okay. It, we got it. <laughs> oh, Andy says he just sees me. You don't see me? You see me, Andy? Andy doesn't see you. You don't exist. Invisible. This whole time. Oh, that would be a great show. <laughs> Where I pretend like you're on there for an episode and I yeah. keep talking to you. Yeah. <laughs> you're so crazy, girl. And there's nobody there. <laughs> that would be hilarious. <laughs> we do that one on mental health. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, that would be good. So then, you know, and then I could just like pop in and out. Yeah. You, know? you can make yourself like, move. And then you'd be like, is this real or is this Memorex? <laughs> oh, some of you probably don't even remember what that is. Mm -hmm. Is this real or Memorex? <sighs> I mean, come I'll break on. break up my VCR for that joke. <laughs> oh. Um, yeah. You're so Betamax. <laughs> <clears throat> These are old people jokes. <laughs> Nobody knows what the hell we're talking about. Uh, so um, yeah, this is why this is why I'm working with this guy, right? So I just so crack then, up the whole time. Look, everybody's cracking up. Yeah, they. So and then he gets right back into it. They're like, just admitting we can't like spend five minutes like joking around. They're just admitting <laughs> that they're age appropriate for this whole thing. <laughs> yeah. I think uh, most of you guys are probably ready for a colonoscopy. <laughs> I like it. If you like the Backstreet Boys, <laughs> it's time for a colonoscopy. <laughs> like, I love that. Uh, and now they're doing and nobody's laundry. laughing. Now they're doing laundry commercials. <laughs> yeah. Like, they used to be these sexy, sexy men. All the women just wanted them. But that's bounty. And now they're doing <laughs> laundry commercials. That's the bounty commercials. Bounty? What's the commercial where the, the dude's riding on the horse? Ladies, chime in. 
There, yeah, he Sounds was Sounds like, like somebody has oh, a very specific a... commercial they like. <laughs> <laughs> it's underarm deodorant, I think. No, I don't know what you're talking about. Anyway. I just tune them out anyways. Now, okay. If it was M&M, like, I'd just be like, oh, yeah, I know that commercial. Mm. <laughs> oh. Oh, yeah. I'm on a five-year colonoscopy plan. Colonoscopy, uh, colonoscopy plan. Yeah, it is super sketchy to get those, but. What? Uh, um, we'll talk about that later. Okay, another episode. Know. Well, all right. Seems a bit invasive. I don't know. But, five yeah. years? Yeah, a lot of people do that, especially if they had some. Yeah. So, so I didn't know. Is that's like a? It's kind of like um, getting an annual exam. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, yeah, okay. Yeah, and the task task force like that. has all these recommendations that doctors go by. So if so, you want your hemoglobin to be about fourteen sixteen, but if you don't do a whole lot, it might be a little bit lower. And then if it's below those numbers, then you got anemia. And the next question is, what size is the red blood cell? Is it anemia because it's too small? So it starts out big. If it's too big, it's over 100 on the MCV, or mean corpuscular volume. If it goes down to a 90, it's perfect. But if it gets too small, it's less than 80, that's because iron. So if you have that anemia from the hemoglobin, then you look at MCV, and you say, is it microacidic for iron, or is it megaplastic because of B12 and folate, or is it normal acidic anemia because you have some chronic disease, medication mm -hmm. side effect, or a whole myriad of other things that are just decreasing your bone's ability to make the red blood cells in the first place. So those are all things that we want to look at to make sure it's an accurate, actual diagnosis. But I'm telling you, time after time after time after time, time they will after say- Time after time. That was for Joanne. They don't ever ask the next question of what size it is. They just jump to giving you iron, and if you don't need iron, then you end up getting iron uh, uh, iron overload. You end up getting constipation, causing all kinds of other problems. See, I Jan watch. She says, "Doctor Garrett, Doctor G is brilliant. He changed my life." That's wonderful. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So we need and more. And he probably had a lot of jokes too. <laughs> yeah. Always. Well, you know, laughter is healing too. Um, I That's read... why I look this way. <clears throat> I have a very healing face. <laughs> I, honestly, I, I watched a, a, a short vid, or a, I don't remember what it was. Look it's at long... you, short vid. She's so lit. Look, <laughs> I don't even know hand signals and stuff. West side. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I watched a video about a lady who developed uh, cancer. And so she decided um, she was just going to hold herself hostage in, inside of her home, which you would think, ugh. You know, that's not good. Hi. It's Coraline. It's Coraline. Hi, Coraline. <laughs> Look, he's blushing. Shut it down. <laughs> anyway, she decided all she was going to do during her treatment phases was she was going to watch comedy hmm. the whole time. And so for like six weeks, she laughed her off. Cancer off. Yeah. Yeah. And she did. And she died four weeks later. Oh. Did you, guys, did you ever see Children's Hospital? She did not. The comedy? No. <laughs> <laughs> There's a doctor out there. It's, it's, a, it's a spoof show. <laughs> but the doctor's like, <laughs> this girl has low cancer. <laughs> and he says, we use humor as medicine. <laughs> and so he's like just making jokes and stuff. And then she died. Oh. It's so sad. So it didn't so. work that time. <laughs> yeah. Oh. I don't know. All right, so then. Well, at least at least she was happy. Yeah. During a phase. That's so, right. Yeah. See, I just joke around with all my patients and talk <laughs> shit, and I'm curing them that way too. Huh? <laughs> all right, so then there's a. I can't keep up with the stuff what? going on here. Kidney disease. Patch, or sorry. Patch Adams, what? the movie. Yeah. Mm. Patch Adams. So, um, here's something a little bit more serious. Um, serious. Okay, so G Jean says, I have weird red blood cells, irregular shape and size. Ooh, I like that. <laughs> Always low. It's anacytosis. What happens? An anacytosis. Anacytosis? Should be right. 
always low in ferritin and iron. I'm I'm a mutant JAK2 positive. Ooh. Whoops, there's more. That's the Jack 2 gene. Jack, Jack 2. 2. Yeah, JAK. <clears throat> Yeah. So there's, uh, that's because of a genetic mutation. Uh, so that controls the, the, the development of the red blood cells in the red marrow. Um, and so, you know, it should be like shaped like a donut, um, super thin in the middle. There's not an actual hole, but um, all kinds of stuff. Medications can affect the development of red blood cells, certain conditions, uh, certain genetic mutations. So what you, what'll happen is your body is going to overproduce and overcompensate to make uh, sure there's enough non-mutated looking um, red blood cells that can carry o oxygen adequately. So yeah, that's not an uncommon thing. That's why every now and then, like if, if there's a real questionable thing going on, uh, if they're normal acidic anemia, so it's not iron, it's not full B12, then usually you do a blood smear and then you can see, are they stippled red blood cells? Are they sickle cell or misshapen somehow? Um, and then that's a whole other uh, line of uh, treatment and process, for sure. Oh, bragging about your Jack 2 gene? <laughs> I was like, I was trying, trying to find our music. Jack 2. That is like... Okay. <laughs> anyway, GD we're working Jacks. on a new podcast series, so yeah. yeah. So we're we're putting some stuff on together. the Jack Two gene, which is crazy. No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so then with like kidney disease or kidneys with your laboratory interpretation. So <clears throat> again, rarely does anybody ever get told anything about their kidney actual function. Uh, so there's three main ones that we have when it comes to the kidney uh, interpretation on your labs. The first one is uh, your BUN or BUN, blood, urine, nitrogen. And so whether you eat a bunch of plants for protein or animals for protein, you will then make ammonia and toxic chemicals like urea, and then you overconsume water and you pee those things out. So this test, the BUN, which is the standard one on your labs, will tell you how well you're doing at getting rid of the ammonia and urea or the toxic metabolic, me metabolic waste uh, products there. Well, and you can really tell when there's ammonia, when you're... Our next episode is going to be on interrupting. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> so wait, what? Say it again. Well, you can tell when there's ammonia in your urine. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's strong. Yeah. I mean, I've had some, some serious issues in my past. Really? Yeah. I have, both of my ureters have been corrected or replaced. I can't remember which one. Because so of kidney I stones died. or something? I died when I was little. What? Yeah. Because I, they could Are you here now? <laughs> see? He's not sure. Do you all He's see her? Sure. <laughs> Do you all see her? <laughs> But I did, like, I, they packed me in ice, and they couldn't, they didn't know how um, they were going to fix anything. They just went and wheeled me right into surgery. And, what? Yeah. And it was my ureters. They were blocked. They were bent. Yeah. And so I would just constantly be in, you know, fever phase, and they couldn't figure anything out. And so they just opened me wide open and said, hey, look. Yeah. And what? I was, yeah. Oh, my gosh. So you're a so miracle. Yeah. Yeah. Times three. I have three? six more lives to live. My goodness. And I'm the one that I thought survives everything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You do have, yeah. you have what, four lives left? Mm, I don't know. You have four. All I got left is gray hair and this dogged sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, those, those little U-shaped things inside your kidneys too, those are. Oh, the loops of Henley. The loops of Henley. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oompa Loompas. Oompa Loompas of Henleys. <laughs> so with uh, i can't believe that that's crazy but all right so what? they that's they packed you on ice Did they put you in the freezer for like a couple weeks and then like <laughs> read through some books and like ah oh, crooked ureters yeah and then they followed you back out <laughs> oh, you're funny. no all right no i want to hear more about this story oh but we, I need a martini for it. Yeah, we should do that one time. Just have a show where we're just talking mm. about stuff instead of like being so. Mm. Anyway. 
Everybody so. seems to like it. So. <laughs> anyway, I'm here. Okay, so Having BUN. BUN. So with uh, the BUN or your BUN, um, <laughs> so that number, they'll let, uh, go up to 20. And I want to say that dude that almost died, he he was probably like 30 or 40. Like it was something I've never seen before ever. But usually people, they get up to 20, they, 25, they don't start feeling, they start to feel kind of bad. But I like to see that below 15. So 15 and below, you can go all the way up to 19. But really, that shows you're drinking plenty of water and you're peeing out all the toxic metabolites. The next one's more of a short-term indicator of the same thing as the creatinine. And creatinine, uh, I like to see about 0.75, but they'll let you go to one, sometimes 1.2, but that's a little on the higher side there. And so we like to see that closer to that 0.75. And, and you'll see that on your lab results every time. Almost yeah. every time. Yeah, almost every lab yeah. includes this. Yeah. But then the really important lab that they do for kidneys is uh, the most complicated one to ever say, and that's <laughs> the EGFR. So the estimated glomerular filtration rate which your kidney is 18 million little filters, and this tells how well they filter through that little... Oompa Loompa. Oompa Loompa of Henley. Oompa Loompa Loompa of Henley. It's Loompa Henley, yeah. Loompa Henley. But Dr. Henley figured this out. But it's kind of crazy, because you have all this... I mean, this teeny, tiny, 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 tiny little loop is where electrolytes are pulled in and out, and then whatever's left becomes urine, right? So it's making all these micro calculations in these teeny fragments of, of, of length in your kidneys. And so this EGFR, it tells you how well it's working. But again, like our ranges are not real. They're not the therapeutic ranges. So a lot of labs will just say greater than 60. And that is the most messed up range I've ever seen because 60 to 90 is considered low function normal. Like, it is so messed up that people are, are so messed, uh, they have such poor kidney function in the United States. Uh, like, they have dialysis machine centers everywhere now, right? That literally 60 to 90 is stage one kidney disease. But we don't care because everybody's kind of in there anyways. So, is that first stage, we'll consider that normal. That's normal. But 90 to 120 is considered your goal. 90 to 120 is the actual normal value, right? Mm -hmm. But because so many people have kidney problems, they lowered that number. And they consider that first phase. So if you get like a, a 60, something that's a lab that just says greater than 60, is that 60 or 61 or 91 or 120? How well are my kidneys doing? And so literally, it's like I'm not going to tell you how much gas is in your car it's greater than empty good luck <laughs> <laughs> so it's horrible horrible especially because half the medications people take kill the kidneys the other half mm -hmm. kill the liver so even something like ibuprofen aspirin it's the leading cause of kidney failure it is irresponsibly or irresponsible to not test what the actual number is for your kidney. That is unacceptable. Yeah. So I'm gonna give you stuff that kills your kidneys and I don't care until your kidneys have actually failed, failed. And, and you have and to go to dialysis. And then you gotta go to dialysis and we're super screwed. So, not cool. Mm -mm. So if you get those done, you really want the numbers to just be the actual numbers and then you want that to be 90 and above. For most people, you just drink more water and you're gonna be good. Mm -hmm. Just your filter is going to work better if you're using your filter. But a lot of medications mess up that. Even hypertensive medications, you know, the number one side effect, or sorry, 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 one of the most common side effects of um, uh, blood pressure medicine is you have a heart attack, right? It's the number one. Is it the number one? I think so. Oh, shit, yeah. <laughs> so, and that's because it actually messes up <clears throat> the mechanism that then causes you to have things like heart attacks. Yeah. But before that, it messes up your kidneys. And so then if you can't get your kidneys to work, then the fluid builds up, then you get congestive heart failure, 
And now you have to deal with that mess because you're taking the medication to prevent heart disease that now is causing heart disease because of messed up your kidneys. So that number is really important. Cycle. <laughs> All right, ready? One, okay. two, three. There we go. But did you do the head thing too? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Don't make me read you, write you, erase you, Xerox you, and fax you, and shred you. <laughs> you remember that? Mad TV? That's oh. old school. It's almost as old as your Betamax. <laughs> Cassette player. Because your a -track, VCR. A-track player in my dots and B210. It had sport louvers on the back of it. Dr. Dre, <laughs> before they got famous, drove a B210. Are you serious? Mm hmm. With sport louvers on the back? Girl, you know I keep it real. This is West Side. <laughs> All right. MAD. The hell's that? Preach it. Man. Oh, Mad TV. Yeah, yeah. All right, and the last one that we'll talk about when we're. Uh, uh, we have plenty of time. We got nine minutes. We got more time. Than Do you want to use my glasses? <laughs> <laughs> nine minutes. We got plenty of time. Where nine are minutes. we? Yeah, we're already. I know we're done. So, liver. Liver is another big one that they have on your uh, laboratory uh, tests that often <laughs> is overlooked, misdiagnosed, nobody cares about until it's all horrible, but. Three main liver enzymes. Actually, there's a fourth one, but we'll keep it a secret for a minute. So there's AST, ALT. Those are your main two liver enzymes. ALKFOS gets thrown in there a little bit because it's partially uh, liver. But the thing about these tests, too, a lot of these tests are not what you think they are. So we're taught this stuff, but is it liver or is it inflammation? Because inflammation can actually make your ALT and AST go up without oh. actual liver involvement. Your ALK-FOS can go up because of pancreatic problems, not because of liver and bone, which we're taught the testing. So if you ever worried about AST, ALT, you do a GGT, which why don't we do it in the first place? Because again, half medications kill your liver. Things like statins are notorious oh. for messing up your liver. Uh, oh they should probably be doing GGTs all the time. But GGT is a, a liver test that's truly liver. The rest of them are, could be liver. Let's do a GGT to figure out this, right? That's GGT. Yep. Because you told me that today and I was like, G GBT, G G GGT? GGT. Sounds like a supplement. Try GGT for three months and see if you don't get your... <laughs> What's that? <laughs> that movie where that guy's commercial, his hand gets stuck in the commercial and it just like keeps replaying. <laughs> oh, I know that one. Wait, with the robot? Yeah, maybe. Right. So, AST, ALT, ALKFOS, general kind of liver. But your AST, ALT, your main ones, we like to see those below 20. Like functional ranges, you want to kind of see them below 20. It's okay that your liver swells up. And then it'll heal and swell and heal, right? It's all good. And that's normal. That's normal, yeah. Yeah, and often people think the liver's toxic because it's the biggest detoxifier. But it's detoxifying things. It doesn't store up toxicity typically. So even if you, like Bear Grylls, and you find a dead animal, you eat the liver and the eye juice. That's the last to actually go bad. Super nutrient dense. Eye juice. Did you, did you really have to say eye juice, though? I got my middle daughter to eat eyeballs with me. Oh, I, I like uh, red snapper eyeballs. Fried. But that may, then the probably The whole not. fish? Yeah. Down in Belize, Sean, down in Belize, yeah. they fry the whole fish in yeah. most countries. He ate the head first. Yeah. And ate the whole fish. Yeah. Like, we ain't animals. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are. Yeah, but you. I do all kinds of. Those bones have. I know. It's good for you. If you eat, if you eat the part of the animal that you want better, you want better eyes, eat the eyes. You want better liver, eat the liver. You want better joints, you eat their joints, right? So what about carrots? What about carrots? <laughs> How does that even affect you? No, 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 carrot, because because the human body is created from the ingredients of food. 
So if we eat an animal's body part, it has every nutrient we need for our body part, right? So, but if you eat food, it makes all your body parts also, right? So either way. Wow. Eat food or eat the animal's face so you can have a prettier face. You think all this just happened? I've been eating <laughs> chinchilla faces. That's why it looks like a chinchilla. Yeah. <laughs> I might have to go in the other room. I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so, <laughs> with liver, it's very important. If they're 200 times that uh, or that range, or 100 times that range, like 200, 400, <laughs> that's where it starts getting concerning. <laughs> I'm sorry. Cannibals. So he's talking about cannibals. Cannibals would not eat humans. They need to make a movie about healthy cannibals. And yeah. they're like, son, don't eat the Americans. You're going to get heart disease and cancer. There's we got to eat answer. the Europeans. That's your answer. I'd be all like, look, as a functional medicine cannibal, I only eat European people. <laughs> and it only in Switzerland. So it's a tax write-off. Oh, and the wine from Switzerland is fantastic. Switzerland does not make wine. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Somebody's... Are you being serious? Mess with my head. Swiss yeah. wine? I ain't yeah. never heard of a Swiss wine. Yeah, they yeah. had them there. I you passed by all kinds find of... It. You, it, no, you I literally pass. hiked past the wine fields near Montreux on the way to France. You know what I'm saying? On the Lake Geneva. So it's not a big deal. Wine. It's not a big deal. <laughs> so it's a little tiny field. But they were... It was a tiny one. Was it? Yeah. Well, maybe I they just made it for either. themselves. That, that could be. Maybe the Swiss don't share the wine. That's why we don't have a Swiss one in Jacob's Liquor Store. <laughs> There's no Swiss category in there. Go to ABC. I'll get you some. Or I'll drink it for you. <laughs> give you the bottle. <laughs> I'm not going to white trash ABC Liquor Store. Do they really have it there? <laughs> yes. hmm. Better not take the Mercedes. It'll get jacked. <laughs> oh. Am I going to get stabbed going there? I just wanted some Swiss uh, wine. I didn't want to get stabbed in the parking lot. <laughs> Gee, did you really? Did you Do we taste like chicken? All right, so you want to know something? Well, I'm not even... A We're off the rails on this. I suggest that we get wine, because we're actually doing this at <clears throat> Suzanne's place instead of the office. So we usually we drink wine over here. Um, because apparently all single women have boxed wine in their fr in their fridges, but sometimes two. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> two different flavors. So I had to drink water. This is all dry humor off water, just so you know. But <laughs> yeah. so Jean's like, gosh, y'all, can you imagine if he did have a glass of wine? Do you know what long pig is? You guys don't want to know this. Okay, don't. <laughs> long pig is considered human because humans taste like pigs, right? Human meat, pig meat tastes the same. So, if you Does eat, it really? That's what they say. I'm not trying to find out <laughs> unless I go to Switzerland. But then that means oh that if you eat pig skin, literally, what world do we live in that we actually like skin pigs and fry it up and be like, I love pork rinds. I grew up eating pork rinds. You're like, you're just eating the skin from a pig? Like, that seems cruel. But pigs taste like humans, so if you eat pork rinds, you like pork rinds? We literally lost one, one viewer. I don't want you <laughs> on an island with me, because you already got the taste for human. So, all right. Pork rinds. Oh, that's a whole nother one. What? All of these, this outbreak in pork rinds, they're healthy for you now, and there's all kinds of oh, different it's flavors, at the health food store, yeah. and it's at the health food store. It's just fried pig skin. It is. How's that? Well, so, but it should be fried in olive oil. They should make pork rind Doritos. I don't know. Seems like, like in it. the shape of the they should make Maybe pork my kids rinds would eat those instead they of Doritos because they're. What about well, why aren't there chicken rinds and cow rinds? Why? I think we're missing out. I think out. there's vegan rinds too. Yeah. So Jan Watts, you should eat eyes. You definitely <laughs> should eat eyes. Because all the macula, the macula is full of all these antioxidants and, and, and pigment colors. And when you eat that cow's eye, you would get all the things you need for your eyes. Well, you I'm know, telling you, it sounds disgusting. But people, like... Well, look at sardines. Animals do it. I know sardines. And, I, and, and, and I eat in the, the whole, Asian culture, 
There are so many different types of fish over there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I love going over there. Yeah. I miss going over there. Don't be all judgy yeah. Americans because you want to eat eyes. <laughs> While you're munching on a pig's skin. Like, <laughs> what the hell's wrong with us? Oh. So. Woo! I mm. asked, we went to an Asian place, and I, I just, like, asked Coraline. They had monkey brains on the, on the menu. And, uh. She said, uh, no sardines. She thought they were monkey brains. <laughs> oh. Like, but it's a fish place. But oh. would you eat monkey brains if they had served monkey brains? Because at the, at the Asian place, usually it's avocado with crab meat and then like sriracha. That's that's how I make monkey brains at home. But but uh, it's, just a, it's just a dish called that. It's not yeah, literally. It's not really monkey brains. Oh. But I wouldn't eat it because then you get like mad monkey brain disease or something. Like cow disease. Mm -hmm. Oh, Andy and he's like, oh, Andy yeah, won't eat, bro. What, he, what, sardines or? Oh yeah, I love sardines, but I eat some sardines and then this garlic, Oysters, and then uh, Corlin was like, you smell horrible and you need to go brush your teeth. Yeah. So. Well, so so like, <clears throat> a lot of these foods that like are are oysters okay? No, oysters um, are the filter of the grossest ass on water. The the... Yeah. Yeah. Dang it. We clean, we pollute the water, they clean it up, and then they feed you it, and then you act like it's an aphrodisiac as you get cancer. Oh. So, it's gross. All right. Well, so darn I, it. I guess I'll stop eating those, because they don't work. Bill, like, you got to eat the shell, too. <laughs> I hate eating the oysters on a half shell, because the shell gets stuck, like, in my throat, and then that's not attractive. No. <laughs> What is the other thing? Not oysters. clams. Clams are clams the same as they're oysters? just filters of the grossest waters we can find. So we should get fresh uh, or sea water. Yeah, from another get country, them. not like because from the Gulf of Mexico, that's the toilet bowl <clears throat> for every river in the United States. There's eight dead zones in the Gulf of Mexico. The last part of the Mississippi before it dumps into the Gulf to feed your shrimp and your oysters is called the Cancer Alley. People go to work. They get up. They set an alarm. They set an alarm to get up to go work in a place called the Cancer Alley. That's real? That's real. And then they dumps out into the Gulf of Mexico, and then you guys eat that food. Mm -mm. Ooh. And the Gulf of Mexico, this has nothing to do with live interpretation anymore. The Gulf of Mexico was on fire. There was a ring of fire in the Gulf of Mexico. You know how you put out water? Or put out, uh, should I ruin it? <laughs> Gene's <clears throat> trying to get us back on track. Do you know how you put out fire? <clears throat> With water. But what do you do when the water is what's on fire? <laughs> so. Do you know that? Yeah. I and then you all want to eat food from the Gulf? Gross. Well, in here, you know, and really when you're looking at labels, it should just be that thing and maybe water. It's like you guys are going to Tijuana, not the Strip, a <laughs> couple streets back, trying to figure out where the gourmet food is. It's gross. Okay. Don't do that. The Gulf and, and is I gross. I would say honestly, there's places in in our in our country that are like that too. <gasps> you anti-American. Well, America's perfect. <laughs> I'm just saying it like I personally feel like. No, it. I know. But. I know. But, we should okay. talk about those. So, so Jean has she wants to get us back on track. Mm. <laughs> so we're just we need to. Jean, oh, what five we'll, tests? We definitely will get to that. Um, but we do sometimes need some comic relief. <clears throat> I mean, it is like seven o'clock. We've worked all day and and stuff. Hey, so CBC, go ahead. <clears throat> CMP, T uh, T three free. Mm. Bye, Andy. Bye, Andy. T3 free. Anything else? That's. I mean, if you're going to get it like a cholesterol, you just get a lipo fraction or lipo protein fractionization. That tells you better information because th cholesterol doesn't kill anybody. Um, oh, maybe A1C would be really good. Um, homocysteine is good cardiovascular inflammatory marker and tells you kind of how your homocysteine pathways are working. Um, that's kind of it. Like, I, 
you know, if you cover the basics and, and you stop causing problems, most things just improve. Like, it's not all that complicated. So, uh, if you have thyroid, you want to do autoimmune tests to make sure there's no autoimmune stuff with that. But, really, it's pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's nice just to get those labs done to where you know, like, okay, my liver's good, my my kidneys are great, my blood sugar's good, my electrolytes are good, my immune cells are good. Like, just know. Knowing everything is kind of where it should be or you need to tighten up little areas just to kind of fine-tune it Like even having normal labs are really important. I'll say the other thing too is as we leave is Patterns are the most important one lab value does not tell you jack crap So back when I used to teach this you'd be like hey if your blood sugar if your patient's blood sugar is 300 What do you guys think and like everybody get all freaking out about this 300 because it's way too high mm -hmm. But what if their last one was 500 and the one before that was 600? Well, oh, they're doing really good. They just need to keep that up. Well, it totally changes. One lab value doesn't tell whether it's going up, down, <clears throat> or staying the same. We always just assume worse. But even if someone's liver enzymes are elevated, are they getting better or are they going up? If their thyroid's elevated, is it going up or going down? So pattern's the most important. Two to three labs over the six months to a year, that's really the, the, the best information you can get with that. So. That's good. Yeah. Those are good. All right. Um, can mm. I just. No. Mm. Have mm. To eat? Uh, mm. Okay. So I know we're, we're over our time, <gasps> but we just, uh, we just want to uh, invite you to keep um, paying attention to what we're doing. There's lots of changes coming up. Um, oh, yeah. We're excited about those changes. We're going to be working um, on podcasts and um, commercials, all kinds of good stuff. Um, but mostly, um, we're creating a venue. Um, well, can I say it? I know you said it. Not last yet. Time. Not yet. Not yet. Right. So it's all the same. <laughs> Not yet. Anyway, a lot of stuff's coming. Yeah. So I'm super excited about that. So. All right, guys. Thank you for joining us. Love you guys. Appreciate the questions and the feedback. And uh, next time we're going to finish up talking about functional medicine's approach to autoimmune conditions and reversing those through T-cell dysregulation like the mimicry. And uh, then we'll kind of like touch up on some of y'all's questions that you've had through this series. And then uh, appreciate you guys being here. Bye, y'all. Thanks for listening.